making a fresh start in the new sermon series called Make a Fresh Start. And if you have your bulletins, you'll see if we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah for the entire series. Works out to be about eight weeks, but we're going to extend it to about Wednesday of that week so that it will be 52 days. And I want it to be 52 days because that is a significant amount of time in the book of Nehemiah. And they say 30 to 40 days to make a new habit. I want to make sure you've really got it down. So we're going to go the whole 52 days to make a fresh start somewhere in your life. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. But I have to point this out. It was an accidentally cool thing that I did. So whenever I do something cool, I want everyone to know, especially my children. Mom's cool. Uh, you let them know that, okay? <laughs> uh, but Nehemiah, we're starting in chapter 1, verse 1, and going through 1-1. One, one. So I thought that's a great way to start the new year. 1-1-1-1-1. One, 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 one. It's a new beginning, and it can be. Scripture tells us in Isaiah 43, forget the things of past. Forget those things, the former things. I'm doing a new thing right now, and you know God is able to do a new thing, both for our church and for us as individuals. Amen. So, since Nehemiah is a book, a, a historical book, it's actually the last of the historical books in the Bible, we have to spend a, at least a minute on history. And uh, ironically, maybe, or just the way God works, Kent taught Sunday school this morning, and I sat in for a bit of it, and guess what they did? Is uh, Israelite history. She going to get a double dose of that? We didn't plan it. We hardly even talked about it. He was in his corner doing his thing, and I was in my corner doing my thing. But it uh, turns out we say a lot of the same stuff. We've been living together too long or something. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm going to say my history in about a minute. It took him longer. <laughs> the Israelites had been taken captive into Babylonia. Uh, the Babylonians had wiped them out, crushed Jerusalem. They had been disobedient. God had forewarned that this would happen as a result of their disobedience. This is Judah, the southern nation. The northern nation had already been carried off by the Assyrians. This is what's left, and things did not fare out very well for them. They were in captivity for 70 years, but God kept his promise and gave them a way out. And so Babylonia is crushed and the Persian armies come in and they break the Babylonians. So now the Persians are the world empire to be messed with. And when they come in, they say, all right, the king services, those of you who have been taken into exile, you may return. And so 50,000 of them at first take uh, the king up on his offer and they head back to Jerusalem. These 50,000 Israelites got busy right away rebuilding the temple. Great idea. If you're broken, captive, start with God's home. Start with making God a home in your temple. Right there, great start. Unfortunately, they weren't quite as strong as they needed to be. The result was not as strong as it needed to be. And the people who had moved in during their captivity began to discourage them. So they stopped working on the temple about the time the foundation got built. And then they left it. A few years later, Haggai and Zechariah arrived to the scene and encouraged them, hey, you need to clean up this mess, finish the temple. And so they are able to finish the temple then. Ezra comes on, and under Ezra's leadership, Another 60 years comes and go, but now a second wave of exiles return to Jerusalem. And they're there for about 12 years, and then we meet Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is now on the scene. He is not a priest or a judge or anyone significant among the scribes and uh, teachers of the law, the Sanhedrin. He's no one significant like that. What he is, though, is a politician of sorts. And he happens to work for the king of Persia. I didn't try to say this before, I might attempt now. King Artaxerxes, And he's the cupbearer. It's a hotshot position, and he's a bit of a hotshot. He's trusted by the king and often in the company of the king. His job is simply to taste the 
wine or what the king is drinking before it's handed off to the king. So it is a job with some risk. Someone's trying to poison the king, guess how they find out? <laughs> Nehemiah is down on the floor. Oh, yeah, he was trying to be poisoned. Fortunately, he survives these 12 years, and he has a couple of his brothers, uh, or one brother, or someone who's like a brother, and his friends come from Judah to visit him. Hanani, the brother, gives him a report of what's going on, and we read about this starting in verse 2. It says, I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity <coughs> and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So they have rebuilt the temple, but then that's it. Over a hundred, or nearly a hundred years have gone by since the first captives came back from uh, Babylon. And the place is still in ruins. A whole generation of Israelites living in the midst of this rubble and messiness and brokenness. It's like they didn't even notice. They didn't remember how it was before they were carried off into captivity. That was probably their parents, and their parents probably did not pass down the glory that had been Jerusalem's when they were there. They don't do anything about it, but when Nehemiah hears this, he's deeply disturbed. This is not good news. And he immediately takes personal responsibility. He looks at it and takes it directly to the Lord. Now, while Nehemiah is a historical book, I would say that there are some things here that are very relevant to our lives right now. There are some things we can learn from how he manages this great need, this great need for a fresh start and for a change. Nehemiah heard of the need to rebuild. If you're keeping track in your bulletins, that's the first one. I would ask you, what area in your life needs some attention? Maybe your gates are burned and your walls are down, allowing the enemy to have free access to you or tempting you to a point where you don't know you're strong enough to resist. Maybe there's some hurts or some unforgiveness or excessive worry, anxiety, habitual sin, unhealthy self-care, poor eating habits. Overspending, negative thinking, anger, yada yada, you get it, right? What is it in you? Don't tell me out loud. But I don't want I got enough on my own. <laughs> what is God showing you? And if He's not showing you, then you just write down arrogance. Because <laughs> there's something. God would always have you working to grow deeper and deeper in love with God. There's always a way that you can go spiritually deeper. So what in your life is it that you're going to grab a hold of for the next 52 days and just get straight, get it right, renewed, fix it, replace it, replenish it, rework it, renew it. You know, we got revival coming up. It's going to be part of the same bulletin, a fresh beginning. And I love that it's falling right in the, uh, uh, week of this month, the 22nd, 23rd rather, because um, this series is going to continue to challenge you. There's three things that I hope to accomplish, or not me, I hope God will accomplish in you over the next two months. That is that you will um, tackle an area in your life and um, just conquer that, be victorious in that, that goal or that area. The second is, I hope that you will pray more and pray longer. And the third is, I hope that you will work towards being in God's word and actually memorize at least one verse in 52 days, if not more. So that's the challenge in front of all of us. It won't happen by me telling you. you got to want it. And so come with me on this. Let me just encourage you right up front. Take the challenge. Make this a time in your life where you are revived spiritually. Well, Nehemiah sees the ruin, and he says to himself, the same thing I want to say to you, it doesn't have to be that 
way. Amen. Our God's bigger than this. This does not honor God to have things in a mess, shambles, broken. God would have wholeness for us. God would have us be at our very best for him. God would have you make a fresh start and rebuild in any area of your life that does not glorify God to the fullest. Nehemiah heard of the need to rebuild, and he recognizes that situation. So we take time personally to evaluate your life and where it is that you need that rebuilding or remodeling or redoing or rebooting or restoring or remaking or maybe remembering. And just get started. We see the way that he starts, and this is the recommendation, this is where we learn from him, is that he prays. Verse 4 says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. See, this just isn't any, uh, any prayer. This is a, a heart-wrenching prayer, sustained for days. In fact, it's four months before he makes his next move. Four months. I don't know if he's fasting on and off during that time or how that works, what that looks like for him, but I know that this is very serious prayer. It meant something to him, and he was committed to pray over it. Nehemiah starts off his prayer. Then I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. So my challenge to you, pray daily. Pray daily for this change in your life over the next uh, seven, eight weeks. Maybe it's just two minutes a day. You know, experts who talk about making a change in your life they say one of the reasons why the New Year's resolutions so many people make, they don't keep them up and they don't succeed, is because they bite off too much. They're trying to do too much. It's like, you know, take a small amount first, small bites, one step at a time. Celebrate that and then you add to it. Another tip that they give, and this is a Stanford study of 40,000 people in the Wall Street Journal this past week, is that they, um, they you anchor it to another habit that you already have in place. So we have habits in place, whether you realize it or not. Anchor it to one of those. So if you get in the car and you put on your seatbelt every day, that's the time, maybe take two or three minutes to pray over this specific area in your life. Maybe brushing your teeth. If you got an electric toothbrush that goes for two minutes, that's perfect, right? You can even brush your teeth twice or three times a day. There's another study that Dennis said, the more you brush your teeth, the healthier you'll be. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different story, but my brother Todd, who's a dentist, and Donna, who's a dentist, can appreciate that. <laughs> Come to church, you'll be encouraged to brush your teeth. But then I'll be Anyways, uh, start with a, a small bite and then add to it celebrating as you go along the way. Now, what did Nehemiah pray? We see in this first verse, he's praying, oh God of heaven, great and awesome God. How great is our God? He's declaring to God the glory which is God. He's honoring God and worshiping God in his words. God's not only knowing, God's all-knowing. And Nehemiah gets a glimpse of that. Reminds me of Jesus, when Jesus teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Tells us, start out, oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. You start out your prayers remembering who it is you're praying to Amen. and how glorious the God of all heaven and earth is. Amen. Recognize who God is. Worship that God. That's how we start out our prayers. Paul, in his prayer to the Ephesians, reads in a similar tune. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21, saying, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If you don't know how to pray, and I call on you, pray that. <laughs> if you don't know how to pray, you want to know where to start, this is a fantastic prayer. Go to the, the uh, our Father. Go to Ephesians 3.20. 
Start there. They're wonderful, glorious prayers. They will help you in your prayer life. Nehemiah knew how to pray because he knew who God was, and he establishes that right up front. This is a God of power who can manage to build a few walls around the city. He created the universe. He created you and me. He can rebuild the walls both in the world and in our lives. God can fix us. He is able. Nehemiah knew God's power. That's next in your notes. He lists those attributes out to God. I'd like to challenge you. In this area that you want to make a fresh start, pick an attribute of God that will help you in that particular area. If you're struggling with anxiety or you want to overcome worry, pick something about God that helps you in that way. He's a God of peace. His peace surpasses our understanding. He can help you. Pick a scripture that goes along with it. There are many scriptures about anxiety or worry. If you don't know them offhand, you can come to me, and then I'll Google on my phone what they are. <laughs> or you can just Google on your phone prayers about worry, and it will, or scriptures about worry, worry rather. It will give you an assortment of scriptures. Pick one. It will give you attributes about God that might be related to that. Google's a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing for the church. Use it and enjoy it. So, Nehemiah knew that God had power. God wants you to make a change in your life that will glorify God. And if you have that area in your mind right now, let me just reassure you, God's plan is for you to be victorious over it. Not if it's something selfish, oh God, I need a new truck, but sometimes God will give you what you want. But particularly, if there's an area that will help you grow closer to God or help you glorify God or help you take God's uh, word to the world, God's right there helping you. He wants the very, very best for you in every area of your life. He wants to bring about positive change for you. And God is able if you are willing. Those two things kind of go together. God could do it all by himself. But who would want to be a bunch of puppets? That's not who God created in us. God wants you to participate, particularly in your own spirituality. From the very beginning of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have a choice. We need to choose to receive the free gift of salvation. We need to choose, are we going to walk along with God, or are we going to go our own way, the way of the world and sin? With that choice, God sends his spirit if we repent and ask him to come in our life. And God goes with us. Emmanuel, God goes with us and helps us every other step of the way so long as we are willing. Amen. God will help you in every area of your life as you ask God to do that if you are walking in that right relationship with God. And God wants you to participate, and as you're willing, and as you desire it, and as you work towards it, establishing the habits that you need to establish, God is right there cheering you on and helping you. It reminds me of a story uh, I told it last night. It always makes me cry, but it's a story about my uh, daughter, Candy. I taught her to swim at a very young age through a program called Infant ISR, Infant Swim Research. It's now uh, Red Cross's uh, premier way to teach people to swim and help them uh, prevent drowning. But she had just been through one summer of it uh, when she was uh, less than two. And then six months had gone by. And they warned parents, you know, this is not a, a sure leave your kid out by the pool type of thing. It's, yeah, as they grow and as they come out of diapers or if they've got shoes on, their body weight changes, they're not able to float the same way and so forth. But she had had this infant swim research and then six months later, we were at a swimming party, a uh, birthday party for Allie's friends, and she was fully dressed with uh, shoes, shoes on and she didn't want to go swimming, but somehow, uh, I don't know how it happened, I didn't see the actual fall, but she went to the pool. And this was one of those silent fall in the pools. There was no splash, but I had been watching her close enough that once, 
once she wasn't right there, I saw her immediately in the water. And you talk about terrifying. She dropped like a concrete block to the bottom. And I watched her go all the way down and in shock and, and not able even to breathe or yell. Yet the other moms start yelling. We're all watching the pool. It's like, it's candy, it's candy. And I said, just, just wait. And in that moment, I decided to give her a chance to do what she had worked so hard on. She had, you know, established the habit every day for the six or eight weeks of the course, but it was a long time ago. Could she remember it? And if she could, wouldn't that be cool? And if she couldn't, I was right there, ready to jump in. I mean, I was on the edge of the pool, looking down at her, you know, counting breaths. I'm holding my breath at this point. She goes all the way to the bottom, breath, and she comes up and she starts swimming, following her bubbles up, and she gets to the top, flips over, so she stabilizes her float, starts kicking to the edge of the pool, right hand back grabs the edge of the pool. Now, this whole time, when she starts kicking, she's screaming bloody murder, I didn't want to go in the water, I didn't want to go in the water. <laughs> she gets to the edge of the pool, though, and I, I've been standing right over like this, so she comes up and our eyes lock. I'm right here. I mean, there was no way I was leaving. I'm right there watching her and encouraging her. Now she can't get out of the pool on her own. So I pull up my waterlogged daughter and wrapped, uh, someone handed me a dry towel, wrap my arms around her. We talk about it later and she's proud of what she's done. She didn't want to get wet. She makes it up real clear. <laughs> but she did it, she remembered. She conquered it. She later became like the smallest swimmer on the swim team at the club. Not the fastest, but definitely the youngest. <laughs> And she loves the water to this day. That confidence was instilled at a very young age. I think that God is sometimes like that for us. We might not want to do it on our own, but God wants to strengthen us and encourage us. And it's like he's just standing right there at the edge of the pool. Come on, you've got this. If you don't have it, I'm right here to rescue you. And when you've gone as far as you can go, I'm going to reach down and my arms are strong and I can handle the water. It's okay. God wants to encourage us to participate in our own salvation, not in terms of works. We have to do it. We're in once we put our faith in Jesus Christ. But in terms of our development, our spiritual, uh, our spiritual disciplines help us to grow in the knowledge and faith of Jesus Christ. And God wants us to be a part of that process. It's the only way it works. We have a responsibility to be a part of our own uh, spiritual development. Go well, back to Nehemiah. Verse 6. He says to the Lord, Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you have gave us through your servant, Moses. So Nehemiah takes responsibility. He gets it. He's a part of this. He also confesses, confesses and repents of his own doing as a part of it. If there's an area in your life which is broken, it's quite possible you are partly responsible for that, particularly if it involves rejection of God. That's a good place to start. If it involves sin or habitual sin, it's time to get it right. Repent and then move on. Verse 8. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. Think the Assyrians carrying them off. Think the Babylonians carrying them off. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Now this prophecy is still being uh, fulfilled even now. And in the end days when Christ returns, I believe that's when they will be there in Israel. 
It's continuing to be fulfilled, ultimately at the end of the age. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Moses writes, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Does that sound familiar? <coughs> I'm reading it to you because I want to point out that's almost word for word what Nehemiah said in verse 5. And then these, this scripture here it comes out of Deuteronomy 4.29. See, Nehemiah is basically praying back, in our Bible words, the Bible words that had gone before him. Isaiah's words, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Moses' words. We see Moses 4, 29 through 31 written here in just slightly different uh, word usage. Now some have said, well, isn't that convenient? Like, really? Bible, scripture, quoting scripture, one person quoting another person, and you know, like, as if it's not even real. Like, someone just read it and then he wrote it down. Well, I like what Matt Chandler said. He says, Nehemiah is praying through scripture and letting the word of God roll back to God. Not because God needs to be reminded of what he said, but rather we need to be reminded of what uh, God said. Let the word of God drive your prayers. And then he says this, I promise you, it wasn't convenient at all that scripture is quoting scripture. It's 40 different authors over a period of several thousand years <coughs> on three different continents in multiple different languages, all painting the same picture of God's saving work among men. Amen. It's not convenient, it's divine. Amen. It's absolutely divine that we have the scriptures that Nehemiah knew them and then recited them back for us so then we have those scriptures. And we can then refer to them and include them in our prayers. God wants to work through his scriptures. So when I talk about praying back scripture to God, God's not going to be bored by that. God's honored by that. That's a form of worship and it will help you. When you get stuck, you don't know what to pray. Pray to God, God's word. It's absolutely perfect. You can't go wrong. Pick a scripture, a verse that challenges you or brings you hope. And then pray that scripture back. So you begin your prayer honoring God by who God is. And then the next part, you take a scripture verse that speaks to the issue that you're feeling challenged on or that you want to bring about change in. So let me give you an example. Uh, Colossians 3, actually all of Colossians is great. You don't know where to start. That's a great place to start looking for a verse. But Colossians 3, verse 10 is going to be our theme through this series and through the revival. But I picked verse 5 just to get us started so you see what I mean. Let me read it to you first. I think it's, I got a slide for it. Colossians 3, 5, and 10. The scripture is this. Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual desire or immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Verse 10, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So if you were praying through the scripture, the way that Nehemiah prayed through the scriptures, it might be something like this. <clears throat> might start your prayer off, prayer off, you know, Lord, you know, you're a covenant-keeping God or a promise-keeping God or whatever attribute it is. Then you go to the scripture, Lord, help me make this fresh start in my life. I want to put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking in me. I want nothing more to do with these impure thoughts. Help me put on a new nature and be renewed. Amen. Very simple, short prayer. But as you're stopped at the stoplight, or if you ever get stuck at that light at Mulberry, you get to this about 14 times. <laughs> we would be so spiritually mature if well, you guys just take Mulberry. Make that your prayer spot. <laughs> After Nehemiah prays, he gives one final plea in verse 11. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put into
into his heart to be kind to me. So again, four months have gone by before he actually talks to the king. He's willing to do whatever it takes. He's taken personal responsibility. He's repented both for himself and for his family, for the country. He's beginning the process of making a fresh start for Israel and for himself. God uses this situation to grow him as well. If you want to be successful in a change in your life, remember what he did. Take time to pray about it. Take time to learn a scripture to strengthen you. When you start feeling tempted, you go to that scripture. Write it out. Say it out loud. Recite it into your cell phone. Put it on the visor of your car. Put it around your house. Worst case scenario, other people learn it too. <laughs> it's good. Rely upon God. This is, uh, I've got a slide for this over there. Success comes best when you rely upon God. That's the key. There's so many things we cannot do alone. God wants to help you through this. And God will help you as you allow him to help you. Have a deep desire. It's not going to happen without your involvement. Persevere with God's plan. You probably didn't need to make the change overnight. And the change probably isn't going to come overnight. It's one brick at a time. Persevere and enjoy the process, celebrating each of the victories along the way. God is with you. God is with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your message. I just pray again that you will show us what it is you need us to know or to make a fresh, a fresh start about. Each of us with our hurts, or our habits, or our hang-ups. There's a need for change, Lord, and we just look to you. I pray also for anyone here who's just struggling, first off, with salvation. They know that they need to repent and to change. Lord, I pray for that person who's ready to make that change today. Just pray along with me. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the wrong things that I've done. I believe in the work that you did on the cross, your blood to cover my sins. <coughs> Forgive me for those sins. Come into my life. Show me the next step. Help me to become more like you. Just with all eyes closed, if you're willing to just testify <coughs> that that was your prayer today, if you could give me a, a hands up, I want to be praying for you. If you're making a fresh start in your spiritual walk, I, I want you to know I am praying for you. I see your hands. Thank you. I am praying for you, and I'm trusting God will carry you along the way. It is going to be a great year. Amen. Amen.